Hi, everyone. Welcome to our BYOT virtual Candlewick Librarian preview. My name is Sawako Shirota. I'm the manager of library marketing at Candlewick. And I'm joined by my excellent colleague, Dana Eager. Hi. Hi, so we're so excited to be able to give you a sneak peek of our newest titles for spring 22. Today, we're gonna to be talking all about picture books. Uh, and we've also invited two star guest speakers today. Rajni LaRocca, author of I'll Go and Come Back, illustrated by Sarah Palacios, will be kicking us off. And then we'll move on to a brief staff presentation of our uh, picture books. And then lastly, Juana Medina will be uh, closing the preview with a sneak peek of her uh, process of illustrating her newest picture book, Twas a Night Before Pride, written by Joanna McClintic. We're so lucky to get to chat with them and hear all about these gorgeous uh, new titles from the very creators themselves. If you find it useful, uh, feel free to follow along with the Edelweiss catalog with all the titles in order of presentation with the link that um, Dana will be dropping in the chat box for us. And there's also a Q&A feature. So feel free to submit any specific questions for us through the Q&A box below. And we'll try to answer as many as we can uh, at the end. And if you're having technical difficulties, not to worry. This is a recorded session. So we're going to be distributing the <clears throat> link to the archive recording after the event. So you won't miss a thing. All right, let's get started. Get your cuppa here. Here's mine. And uh, we'll spill the tea. Um, take it away, Dana. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Sawako. So I am so excited to get to introduce our first speaker today. Rajani Laraka was born in Bangalore, India, and immigrated to the US as a baby. She graduated from Harvard with both a BA and an MD, and has worked as a primary care physician since 2001. And of course, on top of that, she is the author of several books for young readers, from picture books like Seven Golden Rings, A Tale of Music and Math, to middle grade, like the 2021 New England Book Award finalist, Red, White, and Whole. Her new picture book from Candlewick is I'll Go and Come Back, illustrated by Sarah Palacios. It's a tender, beautifully illustrated story about a girl in America and her grandmother in India, whose love stretches between languages and cultures and across the world. And here she is to talk about her wonderful new picture book. Take it, take it away, Rajani. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here uh, and talk about this book. Uh, it is very close to my heart, and uh, I will start by reading it. I'll go and come back. For the first time since I was a baby, I flew across the world. Oh my goodness. To see, oh, I've lost my screen. To see aunties and uncles, cousin brothers and cousin sisters, and Sita Pati. but India was so different from home. The sky thundered and poured through the humid air. Mosquitoes whined when I tried to sleep. Street dogs woke me at dawn. Trucks honked and children chattered and neighbors gossiped on crowded roads. Everyone stared. In the morning and evening, the house was packed with relatives and friends. But during the day with my cousins at school, I was lonely. I wanted to go home. Then Sita Pati called me. Jyoti, Vama. She didn't speak much English and I didn't speak much Tamil, but we understood each other. Bath, she asked, teeth? All finished, I said, and then I tried the thumbel. Yella achi. She left and took my hand. So I can talk a little bit about um, my grandmother. So if you just advance to the photo of me and my grandmother, that would be great. Um, one of the things that I loved about this story is that I got to put some true things about my grandmother into the story. Um, going to the market with her and picking out the vegetables to eat, and okra is one of my favorite vegetables. Um, how I discovered that my grandmother sometimes cheated at games. 
<laughs> like the Palangari game that I mentioned in the story, she would sometimes miscount. And it wasn't until I was a little bit older that I realized, you know, oh, wait a minute, I caught her one time and I was like, did she just cheat? And I looked over at my cousin and he was like, yeah, she totally cheated. And I thought that was hilarious. You know, my grandmother went through some really difficult things in her life and this was kind of one little way. She loved winning. She just wanted to be able to, to win sometimes. And um, I just thought that was fantastic. Um, and the other thing I will say is that, so this is a photo of me and my grandmother uh, when my grandma came to visit us. She only visited us in the US once. And um, we're actually opening Christmas presents there, which is really hilarious. Um, but uh, my grandmother, when she came to the US, she actually said to my mom, I can't hear a sparrow ch chirp from inside the house. She put it that way in Thummel. And I just thought that was such a way of capturing what it was like to be in a suburban American home as compared to a big boisterous Indian city with the, all the windows open. Um, so I had to put it into the book as well. And um, I just want to say that when I wrote this story, uh, it felt like a very personal story to me and it felt like a small story, like a story about my specific family. But when I shared this with my agent and with publishers, um, the response was way beyond what I had ever imagined. Uh, and it occurred to me that this is how the specific becomes the universal, um, that we share real emotions um, and they connect with other people. Because, you know, especially given the experience of the last 18 months, we all have people whom we love very much that we haven't been able to see as much as we wanted to. And, um, you know, grandparents in particular play such special roles in families. And I was just so happy to be able to write about what my grandmother meant to me. And then I just wanted to also touch upon what an amazing job Sarah Palacios did with the art. Um, you know, I, I, when we were looking for illustrators, I, you know, I thought about how I wanted the Indian city to feel very different from the American um, town. And she did such an amazing job with a color palette and everything with that. And then the other thing I, you know, was really important to me was that the emotions, um, that the love between the characters shine through. And Sarah just absolutely hit that out of the park. So um, I'm so delighted to be able to share this story with you today. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has. Um, hello, that was fabulous. I'm so sorry about the technical difficulties there, but you did a wonderful job of keeping going and we really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, we have a couple questions. Um, Karen Costco asks, have you kept up your tunnel? Oh my goodness. Okay, so that is this, that's the other thing, right? As somebody who grew up in the US, you know, I don't speak Tamil. I only um, have, know a few phrases, basically. I can understand it reasonably well when I'm with my family, but I don't really speak it because I didn't grow up speaking it. In my house, you know, my parents spoke English to me and they spoke Kannada to each other, which was a whole other story. But um, in fact, sometimes, <laughs> so the, the Tamil that they spoke to me was like baby Tamil, like, like you would speak to a little kid. And that was all I ever knew. And so when I was growing up, I actually thought of Tamil as the language that little kids spoke and Kannada as the language that, you know, adults spoke. And, you know, I finally grew up and was like, no, actually there is a language that all kinds of people, including adults speak, <laughs> and it's not what I know. <laughs> Oh, so true. Um, so we have another question um, from Edith. Um, will um, Sita Patti show up in another story? She is a great character. Hmm, oh, interesting. That's, <laughs> that's such a great question. I don't know. I mean, she's, there are no plans for her to be in another story right now, but I'll have to think about that now. She's, <laughs> she's quite spunky like my grandmother was. Um, yes, she's such a great character for sure, as is Jyoti. Um, and speaking of, we have another question. What were some of the things that were important for you to capture in your depiction of this intergenerational connection between Jyoti and Sita Pati? So one of the things was a sense of, even though you come from a place or that you know people and love people that live in a place, that you can st sometimes feel disconnected and confused when you first go there. Um, India, when I was growing up, was seemed like very far away from here. And um, there was no internet, like, you know, we like wrote letters to each other. That was pretty much all there was. And so going there felt like almost like another planet sometimes. So I wanted that sense of like, I love all these people, but I'm really, I'm feeling confused about being here because everything seems so different to me. But 
that the way that we um, become at ease in these situations is through love, is through connection with the people that we love. And the other thing I wanted to do um, was to depict Sita Pati in particular as a real person, like a real person who had her own quirks and like, you know, wanted to win board games and, you know, um, oh, and then the other thing that, that some of the details that are just like things that seem miraculous when you're a child, but um, then you kind of grow up and you do them and they don't seem, they, they seem like very commonplace. When I saw my grandmother make those chapatis on that hot plate and she would just flip it with her fingers. And I was like, how are you not burning your fingers? And she's like, ah, oh, you do it for an, you know, enough years, it's fine. It doesn't bother you anymore. So that kind of detail is something that I wanted to, to bring. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Um, so we have one last question from um, Sandhya. Um, did you share your vision of each spread while working with the illustrator? There are so many beautiful details. And on that same note, do you have a favorite spread? Okay. Um, <laughs> wow. So I did. I did not. I wrote the story, and um, you know, one thing that is kind of amazing to me, but it's also true, is that illustrators work their own magic. So I wrote the words, and I let the art director and the, you know Sarah do their their thing. And the only time I had input was, you know, if there was a question about like, you know, particular details about, you know, India um, or this particular family kind of thing. Um, and as a result, the art is more beautiful than anything I could have ever imagined, um, which is which is really good. <laughs> so um, I, I didn't have a lot to say in the middle of, um, of Sarah doing her art. I got to see early sketches and I literally teared up at, at the way that she depicted this story. Um, and then uh, what was the other part of the question? Was there another part of the question? Uh, oh, just, did you have a favorite spread? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I love them all, but I really have to say that the, the, the two spreads together, the Rangoli spread and the hot, hopscotch spread always blew me away. Just with the beautiful colors and the affection between Jyothi and her party. And if I ever made a hopscotch that, that awesome, that would be a win. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, Ranjani, for being here and for talking about your book and putting up with our um, technical difficulties. Um, so now we're going to move on, I think, to some yeah. other presentations. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much, Rajni. Again, that was amazing. Despite the technical challenges, it was so wonderful to hear about the story behind the, the writing of this book. And I love that the book represents a girl with a third culture perspective who appreciates and celebrates her uh, cultural heritage and also her life in America. And um, I think it's just going to resonate with so many young readers. So thank you. And thank you. sending you a round of virtual applause. <laughs> um, and make sure everyone check this book out. It's coming out in next March. And uh, yeah, Rajin, we'll see you in a little bit. Thanks so much. Thanks. So we're gonna move on to our staff presentation now. Uh, just quickly before we dive in, we highly encourage you to tune in to our second season of the popular uh, Black Creator Series, which is an educator-focused uh, conversation series that highlights the work of Black authors and illustrators led by Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul, and so for a full schedule uh, and more information, you can go to blackcreatorsseries.camelwick.com. As for conferences, we'll be at SLJ Day of Dialogue uh, next. So make sure to register for this free online conference. Illustrator Jamie Kim will be on a panel to discuss her gorgeous picture book, Mommy's Hometown. And Red Ra Rajni, La La Ra sorry, Rajni Laraka, um, who will also be there with us again, um, which we, are so, we feel so lucky to be able to um, bring her to her, this conference, uh, will be speaking on a picture book panel about I'll Go and Come Back, so be sure to tune in. Um, and then this year's Margaret A. Edwards Award winner, Kekla uh, Magoon, will be keynoting at SASL, and, and she'll be talking about her brilliant new YA nonfiction, Revolution in Our Time, The Black Panther Party's Power to the People, uh, that recontextualizes the history of the Panthers. So we're really excited about that. It's a brilliant book. And then we also have a Flipgrid event coming up with Peter Reynolds for International Dot Day uh, next week. 
Uh, so be sure to register for the event through the QR code here. Uh, there will be a paperback version of this book uh, coming out in the spring next year. So we're really delighted to be able to offer that finally. And then we also have a brand new Stink book in the uh, Stink Moody series by Megan McDonald. Oop, I think we're having issues showing you the cover of that right now, but the slides are also going to be in the virtual goodie bag that you're going to be um, receiving after this preview. So you'll be able to see the image there. And it's basically um, just information about also the Judy and Stink Turkey Trot activity sheet. Um, if you're interested in hosting a fun themed run this Thanksgiving, obviously with the current situation, um, you know, we encourage hosting events around your institutional health guidelines uh, for everyone to stay safe, but we just wanted to uh, provide that information as well here. And then make sure you know, uh, you uh, follow our social media account. We're very active uh, on social media. And if you're posting anything during this preview, please use uh, hashtag Candlewick preview. We'd love to hear what you guys are excited about. And don't forget, we're um, also uh, offering a lot of uh, library e-newsletter content out there. So um, make sure to subscribe to our Candlewick Cirque and all of these other newsletters that we have available for you guys um, to stay updated on new digital resources, information about recent releases, author interviews, and more. And then finally, you can access our Fall 21 Lookbook with the QR code here. It offers a bird's eye view of the uh, current list along with a series of fun author videos. Uh, so um, yeah, definitely check this one out. It's really fun. All right, let's move on to the title presentations. Dana will start us off. Hi again. So yes, first of all, I am so excited to talk about Sanctuary, a new gorgeous picture book biography written by Christine McDonald and illustrated by editorial illustrator, Victoria Tentler Krylov. It tells the moving true story of Kip Tiernan, which might sound familiar to those of you in the Boston area. This is the inspirational story of a singular woman and what her vision brought to life. Women who needed a meal or a place to sleep had to disguise themselves in men's clothes because homeless shelters were only for men. So Kip was determined to help these women, just as her grandmother had helped those in need during the depression. She decided to open a new kind of homeless shelter, a sanctuary that would be comfortable for the people staying there. She ultimately convinced the city of Boston to give her an old supermarket building, Rosen's Market, and so she renamed her shelter Rosie's Place to signal it as a safe place for women. And you can see in some of these interior spreads just how gorgeous the art is, and it really evokes that feeling of sanctuary. Um, Rosie's Place first opened on Easter Sunday in 1974, and it was the first shelter in the country just for women. Christine McDonald is the author of many books for young readers and is a longtime teacher and librarian who has taught English to immigrant women at Rosie's Place. This hopeful and informative picture book provides a simple way of introducing young children to themes such as activism, giving back, and kindness, so you won't want to miss it. And next up is This is a School. We are so excited to talk about This is a School. It's a debut picture book from librarian and former ambassador of school libraries for Scholastic, John Shu, and illustrated by Veronica Miller Jameson. It is a moving celebration of school and all that it represents, work and play, creativity and trust, and a supportive community that extends beyond walls. A school isn't just a building, it's all the people who work and learn together. It's a place for discovery and asking questions, a place for sharing, helping, and community. It's a place of hope and healing, even when, like has happened over the past 18 months, that community can't be together in the same room. So in this picture book, John Shu crafts a loving letter to schools and the people that make up the communities within, which you can see in these adorable illustrations from Veronica Miller Jameson. Um, he, of course, has visited schools all over the world and has met with over 130,000 students, teachers, and administrators, which you can really feel in the illustrations and the words shining through every page of this book. The child-friendly illustrations are by, as I said, Veronica Miller Jameson, who is the illustrator of the highly acclaimed picture book, A Computer Called Catherine, and they really complement John Shue's words. So this book is perfect for classrooms and school libraries everywhere. Okay, next we have Mama and Mommy and Me in the Middle. Michael L. Prince Award winner Nina LaCour makes her big debut in picture books with this uh, tale based on her own experiences, thoughtfully rendering a familiar and touching story of a child who misses a parent. It's illustrated by Kehlani Juanita, who is the illustrator of the Stonewall Book Award winner when Aiden became a brother. Slide, please. 
featuring same-sex parents of two loving moms. This is a relatable story of a young girl who misses an absent parent and feels a pang of uncertainty when that parent returns. Next slide, please. And if you look closely at the illustrations, you can see the visual depictions of the biological mother-daughter through a shared condition called piebaldism, which is a condition that is particularly passed down by the birth parent. And final slide. Juanita's distinctive style brings charm and playfulness to this delightful familiar of three, and that takes me, that makes uh, and the text makes a tender exploration of complicated emotions made accessible for everyone. In a market that has limited representation of same-sex parenting for young children, it's wonderful to be able to offer this great addition for all bookshelves, Mama and Mommy and Me in the Middle coming out next March for ages three to seven. And then next we have Arab Arab All Year Long by Kathy Camper, illustrated by Sasan Chalabi. This book celebrates the beauty and diversity of life in the Arab diaspora through the year, throughout the year from January to December. Slide, please. A text by an Arab American author, Kathy Camper, who also wrote the Low Riders in Space book series, brings to light the portrait of Arab American life that goes beyond the stereotypes, taking steps to making Arab culture fresh, modern, and relatable with child-friendly and vibrant illustrations by Sasan Chalabi. This is a book that reflects the 3.5 million Americans of Arab descent who rarely see themselves in picture books. Um, and it's going to be finding so many enthusiastic readers in your library and classrooms who's eager to learn or feel seen. So Arab Arab all year long, coming out next June for ages three to seven. And carry me back. Um, the Town That Walked is an original African-American folktale demonstrating the power of freed Black communities written by David Barclay Moore and beautifully illustrated by renowned artist John Holyfield. In this bold original tale, David Barclay Moore infuses history with wry folk wisdom, metaphorical power, and a splash of magic, which is really evocative on the page with these beautiful illustrations. Though the Civil War is over, times are not improved for the freed Black citizens of Walkerton, Georgia, until one day Rutilla Redgums and her grandson, Julius Jefferson, arrive. Rutilla teaches the citizens of Walkerton how to make all sorts of beautiful things, and their white neighbors can't get enough, but some aren't so happy. When a hooded mob threatens to burn down the town, Julius and Rutilla must work wonders to protect Walkerton and its people, even if it means moving heaven and earth itself. David Barclay Moore, an author and filmmaker, won a Coretta Scott King John Steptoe New Talent Author Award for his debut novel, The Stars Beneath Our Feet, but this is his first picture book. John Holyfield is a renowned fine artist and the illustrator of numerous books for young readers. And as you can see, his artwork really just speaks for itself. He's illustrated books like Belle, The Last Mule at Gee's Bend by Calvin Alexander Ramsey and Betty Stroud. So with these exquisite cinematic illustrations, this portrait of Black endurance draws on the rhythms and traditions of African-American storytelling to open a powerful window into the past that readers will not want to miss. And then next, we have another wonderful picture book biography, Celia Planted a Garden, this time celebrating one of America's first nature writers, gardener extraordinaire, celebrated poet, and fine artist Celia Thaxter. From an all-star team, including two-time Newbery honoree Gary Schmidt and Boston Globe Hornbook Award winner Phyllis Root, and then illustrations from two-time Caldecott honoree Melissa Sweet comes a lyrical picture book biography about this writer who created beauty in a harsh island habitat that was visited by literary and artistic luminaries of her time. When she was 12, Celia's family moved to Appledore Island where her father built a large hotel and Celia planted an ever-growing garden. Guests flocked to the hotel from around the world, among them such writers as Longfellow, Whittier, Hawthorne. Celia wrote poems about the island, her garden, and the sea that would be printed in magazines and books, making her a foremother of writing about nature. Celia Thaxter created joy and beauty wherever she went, and in these often chaotic times, her story carries a subtle message of hope that can uplift readers. Okay, so next we have Queen in the Cave by internationally acclaimed artist Julia Sarda. In her big debut picture book as an author illustrator, Sarda spins an enthralling and evocative modern fairy tale, rich with layers of meaning to be discovered. After dreaming about a marvelous queen who lives in a dark cave in a forest, Franca needs to, uh, needs to know if her dream is true. So with her two younger sisters, Franca ventures into the forest through nettles and thickets, drawing closer and closer to the cave. But then the world shifts 
and everything shrinks and expands at the same time. Here they meet beasts and creatures that shock and delight them. They learn to be brave and face their darkest fears. And what they find in the cave is perhaps the most unexpected thing of all. Uh, slide, please. Sarda has been described as an illustrator's illustrator, as you can see from these stunning and wildly imaginative uh, illustrations on each spread. Uh, this book is composed of 64 pages of amazing art. And this is also a story of sisterly connection while dealing with impending adolescence. And a book about just rediscovering your identity by seeing a different version of yourself. So it's definitely a must read for any lovers of classics with a quirky and modern twist. Coming up next May, The Queen in the Cave for ages five to nine. And next we have Hope is an Arrow, the story of Lebanese American poet Khalil Gibran by award-winning poet and author Corey McCarthy, illustrated by Caldeca Honoree and two-time Curtis Scott King Illustrator Award winner, Eka Holmes. This is a lyrical biography of Khalil Gibran, who is set to be the world's third best-selling poet, and yet little is known about him. Before Gibran ever put his put his pen onto the page. He was Gibran Khalil Gibran, a child immigrant from Lebanon who had a secret hope to connect all people from around the world, despite their differences and, and beliefs. In Lebanon, he's seen Christians crashing with Muslims and in Boston, the wealthy crashed with the poor. Though Gibran struggled with his own fractured sense of self, he found his answer to unite the world with poetry. His secret hope became a book called The Prophet. And even today, Gibran continue to fly around the world, bringing people together. Author Corey McCarthy, McCarthy excuse me, hails from Lebanon and settled in New England, sharing the same path of emigration as Gibran. Text is paired with the glorious illustrations by the inimitable Eka Holmes, who's also local uh, uh, and who has an exhibition of her work actually um, at the at her home base in Boston at the end. next. Uh... Um, hi, so we have another great piece of poetry here um, with kid with take off your brave. Kids say the darndest things, right? And sometimes they write them down. And I know none of you will be surprised by the fact that kids' words can be insightful and beautiful and simply sweet. And just what we need to hear. And that is the idea behind this unique picture book featuring poetry written by a young four-year-old boy. You can see the world through a small child's eyes in this enchanting collection. Four-year-old Nadim puts his words on paper and gives us a glimpse of how he sees the world. One filled with glitter, magical boxes, and cuddles with mom. The poems in this anthology, like this next one, make for joyful reading and are paired with vibrant child-friendly artwork by award-winning illustrator and animator, Yasmin Ismail, that invites us to full-heartedly enter Nadim's world. Um, slide, please. Um, at once funny and sweet, gentle and zany, this anthology might entice readers of all kinds to experiment writing their own poetry. Um, thank you. And next up, um, so adorable. <laughs> we have I'm a Neutrino, which is an exciting new addition to the MIT Kids Press List this season, written by Eve M. Vaviyakis, a physicist who studies experimental cosmology and holds a PhD in physics from Cornell. Before I finish reading the sentence, trillions upon trillions of neutrinos will have passed through your body. If you're not sure what a neutrino is, that's okay. I really wasn't either, but in this book, you can get an up close and personal introduction told in lilting rhyme from the neutrino's point of view with mind bending illustrations that bring the cosmos to life. Some of the smallest bits of matter known to exist, neutrinos are inspiring cutting edge research. Here, playful text and watercolor illustrations blend with photographs from artist and designer Ilza Lemesis, which distill the concept of these mysterious particles down to its essence. And you can learn more with the end notes, know your neutrinos at the end of the book, which provide context for each spread, um, which we, I think we have a couple here. Um, amplifying the science and making complex astrophysics and physics concepts approachable for young readers. So you won't wanna miss this really awesome STEM title. And I think that's the last of that, but we do have some more titles we still want you to be aware of. So first up, we have new books by Flavia Z. Drago, for, which is um, the author of Gustavo, The Shy Ghost, which just made it onto the New York Times bestsellers list this week. So Layla and the Witchy Cakeoff is a sweet and spunky monster-filled picture book. Um, 
which and it's perfect not only for Halloween fans, but also for emerging bakers. And it will also publish in Spanish. And then, of course, we also have these adorable board books coming out from her with her hilariously adorable monster illustrations. Yeah, and we also have a couple more we wanted to put on your radar. We have Johnstone, which is a new book from Mac Barnett and illustrated by Kate Burbay about the celebration of individual, excuse me, individuality and creative expression. We have Mommy's Hometown, which I mentioned earlier, uh, written by Hope Lim and illustrated by Jamie Kim, which depicts the joy of sharing your heritage with your loved ones. We have Out of This World, which is a companion piece to uh, book to the popular Earth First haiku from the ground up. We have, next slide please, um, Lupe Lopez, Rockstar Rolls by E. Charlton Trujillo and Pat Zitmillo, illustrated by Joe uh, Cepeda, about a sassy drummer who must learn to play by the rules. Big Truck Little Island is by uh, the celebrated Chris Van Dusen, inspired by a true story. Air Miles, a companion book to Motor Miles, is based on an idea by the late picture book legend John Burningham, uh, completed by his longtime, long excuse me, longtime friend Bill Salman, and lovingly illustrated by the incomparable Helen Oxenberry, who is Burningham's wife. And then slide, please wait and see, is the sixth poetry and pho photography picture book coll collaboration from award-winning creators Helen Frost and Rick Leiter. Old Whip Boat is a gorgeous picture book about a, uh, and a love letter to sailing by Nikki McClure, who is a nationally celebrated uh, cup paper artist. Something About Grandma by Tanya Durahill is about the magic of grandmothers and passing down traditions. And then next we have The Boy with Flowers in His Hair by Jarvis, which is a sensitively told tale about how to help a friend through illness or trauma, uh, through a beautiful depiction of a friendship between two boys. And then finally, The Poem Forest by former Texas Poet Laureate Carrie Foster, uh, illustrated by Chris Turnham, uh, is about an inspiring story of U.S. Poet Laureate W.S. Merwin's dedication to replanting an entire uh, forest, palm forest in Hawaii. And we also have all of these gorgeous new books from Lucy Cousins, of course, author, author of the Maisie books. And A Good Place specifically has a really awesome environmental message for young readers. So you won't want to miss that. And finally, we have new paperback books, um, The Stuff of Stars, which is the 2019 Coretta Scott King Illustrator Award winner, will be released in paperback, along with Choo Choo School, which is, of course, written by the late beloved author Amy Krauss Rosenthal and has an adorable back to school um, theme. So thank you so much for listening to all of us talk. All yes, of thank you books. so much. <laughs> that was like a race. Um, so now it's time to move on to our closing speaker of the day, Juana Martina. So I had the pleasure of first meeting Juana uh, at a conference back in 2016 when she was promoting Juana and Lucas, which of course went on to win the Pierre Balpré Author Awards uh, and the two International, book, uh, International Latino Book Award. And since then, we got to see the continuation of the extraordinary adventures of Juana, a young Colombian girl growing up in Bogota, and her trusty best friend and dog, Lucas. Slide, please. Um, this series is based on one of the illustrators' childhood in Colombia in book one, two, and now three coming out next month, uh, Juana and Lucas Luchos Changes. We'll also have the first book in paperback in Spanish uh, in the spring, so we're really excited about that. Uh, today, we get to hear about Juana's brand new picture book, Twas the Night Before Pride, written by the brilliant debut author, Joanna McClintic. Uh, if you're looking for a tale that encapsulates the glittering joy and celebratory spirit behind the Pride Parade and Pride Month, you will certainly find it here. It also offers an incredible opportunity for young readers to become better acquainted with uh, the important history of the fight uh, behind the fight for inclusivity and LGBTQ plus rights featuring the beauty of families of every composition. We'll have it simultaneously available in Spanish for ages six to nine coming out in May next year, right on time for Pride Month. So without further ado, I present to you Juana Medina. Thanks so much for joining us, Juana, and take it away. Thank you so much, Soako. It's just such a pleasure to be here with all of you. And uh, it, truly an honor after following all those gorgeous titles and, and Rajani's presentation, which was absolutely just gorgeous. Um, so I wanted to share with you a little bit about the process behind um, Twas the Night Before Pride. 
And uh, of course, starting by saying hello and thank you so much for your time. It's wonderful to share this Friday with all of you. Um, I'm obviously very happy to be here. Um, I got this invitation and it was uh, impossible to say no to such a, a wonderful possibility and opportunity uh, of illustrating Joanna McClintock's um, beautiful um, manuscript for it was the night before Pride. Um, of course, this involved a lot of different uh, steps for me from the books that I had worked on before. Um, and two very important ones were uh, research and representation. Um, and I wanted to, to share a simple example of this um, with this um, illustration of Stonewall when the riots started and how much research went into it. Um, generally, when, whenever looking for images of Stonewall, you just see the facade just in a front view. And I wanted to make sure to just get uh, away from that uh, perspective and, and introduce something else that gave a little more context into New York uh, and especially in 1969. So um, of course it was very hard to visit New York during the pandemic. And um, I had to end up relying on tons of um, images on, on the internet and as well as uh, Google Maps uh, that allowed me to do three dimensional um, you know, perspectives and, and look into it. Of course, the, the biggest challenge was figuring out uh, what the architecture looked like at the time to make sure that it was accurate to represent, uh, for example, you see the police coming in through Chris Christopher Street. I wanted to make sure that I knew which stations they were coming from. Um, I wanted to make sure that the moon was in the right phase for that night in July. And so uh, there was a lot of detail just thinking even, for example, of uh, how big the trees would be at the time, because most of the pictures that I found that encompassed a, a, a wider um, perspective of this view in some kind of way were from the 1930s. Um, and so how, how much would the trees in the park had grown and how would the people gather? So that, this was uh, completely new to me and extremely exciting, just a very different opportunity from what I have had been working on so far. So as you can imagine, I relied extensively on images of every possibility. Here are some of the compilations of images. It allowed me to um, watch many shows, documentaries, and learn tons and tons about this um, a very significant period, um, uh, how the uniforms had changed uh, throughout the time for the police that were involved in the riots, um, how people would be dressed at the time, uh, and so on. Um, and then there were aspects that I wanted to include um, that were um, in our day-to-day -day life and, and that we are still experiencing. And so, for example, you see here uh, one of the moms in the book having a t-shirt that says Ni Una Menos. Um, if you are familiar with uh, this movement in Latin America, it has meant a lot uh, for, um, for women and making sure that uh, we are protected from violence. Um, and I wanted to make sure with, with accuracy to represent everything, even the shadows on the floor, no matter the perspective or the angle that I was working on, making sure that it was inclusive, that I was keeping in mind everything that I was wanting to share with uh, viewers and, and readers. Um, and also ensuring that I was encompassing the plurality that we have um, whenever celebrating pride. Uh, so representing all sorts of families, all sorts of individuals, um, just in a way that was a matter of fact. There was no, um, you know, that I, I didn't want to fall into tropes or, 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 to, or to feel like I was simply just, um, you know, checking on a checklist all, all the all the people that I could think of, but instead think in the most inclusive terms of um, all of us that participate in celebrating pride. Um, and um, of course, this involved many, many details and um, and and it was great fun and particularly meaningful because my own family happens to be a same sex um, a parents family and we came together through adoption and I wanted to make sure that children like mine could hold this book and and, and know that it was um, created for them and with them very much in mind um, and for all kids truly. Um, 
I also wanted to make sure there was historical accuracy and that I made fair representation. So for example, with the Stonewall sign, it was very hard to find a picture. Most of the pictures are in black and white. So it was very hard to figure out which was the real color of the Stonewall sign. Um, I ended up going for this neutral palette after uh, trying to reach out tons and tons of different people that could know or recall this sign. Um, but if you know anything about it, please do share. Uh, I ended up going with a muted palette, which is as much as I could gather from all the uh, pictures. And as you might, if, if you are familiar with my work, you might have noticed that I have some interest in this sort of um, whimsical and somewhat cartoonish um, style. And for this book, I had to keep a different approach for a number of reasons. One of them, making sure that I was having fair representation and I wanted to make sure that I was honoring the people that were taking uh, part in Pride and in, um, and in the riot, the Stonewall riots and that I was representing them fairly and that children could understand that this, this was not meant to be a joke or that nobody would feel that I was uh, caricaturizing anyone, but instead honoring um, their fierce example of, um, of, of bravery uh, for being able to fight for all our rights. Um, there are tons of details throughout the book. I just wanted to highlight a few. Uh, this is a very small vignette within the book. Uh, it happens to be the brooch that uh, Edith Windsor um, wore for 40 something years, I believe, uh, to show her commitment in her relationship with her spouse, uh, given that they could not do so freely with a ring like many of us do nowadays. Um, so even the smallest details uh, were full of intention. Um, there's, uh, there happens to be a character who has a port in, her, in their arm. And for me, it was important to make sure that children all around and readers throughout could find themselves within the book and represent it fairly. Um, and so go examples of, you know, imagery behind um, and, uh, and how I represented the characters with certain personalities and traits. Uh, here is someone who happens to have a cap with a, a monarch butterfly. If you know of um, DACA uh, or, or, or dreamers, um, they have um, found the monarch butterflies as symbols. And I wanted to just give them a nod and know that we are celebrating this together and it encompasses everyone. Even the tattoos had meanings. And so um, incorporating tons of symbols and signs that have been meaningful uh, throughout uh, this historic movement. Um, so th this is process and sketch. And then this is the, the more complete illustration and it's rather small, but I wanted to make sure that I could share it uh, a little bit larger. And of course, throughout this book, I wanted to make sure that plurality and visibility were um, presented and celebrated. So it wasn't uh, just kind of getting, uh, you know, with, with a long list, as I was saying, that I got all the representation, but instead that it was a, a full celebration that then showed and encompassed, encompassed the richness of, uh, of who we are as queers queer people and people within the LGBTQIA community. Um, and so there are tons of details. And it was an absolute treat, of course, to think of representing friends and people that I have had the privilege of have, you know, as mentors and, and, and that have been particularly meaningful represented in some kind of way throughout the book, um, even in the smallest of details. And um, ensuring that it was representational of, of all we encompass as a community. Um, within those same lines, I wanted to make sure that there was acknowledgement for, for pioneers and those that have bravely uh, come out and have worked uh, towards um, equality and equity and inclusivity. And so you might be able to recognize some of these portraits uh, of individuals that have been notable with the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, these are part of the end papers. Um, so this is the front, this is the back. It was truly amazing to have to go through learning tons about different lives and, and quite a humbling process. Um, and many people that we might know and be familiar with uh, represented and, and, and acknowledged throughout the process. So here we see Ursula Nordstrom and Maurice Sandek and Arnold Lobel and 
um, James Marshall and Tommy DePola. So th they all meant so, so much, um, not just as just as as authors and illustrators, but also um, for younger generations of uh, people who consider themselves queer within the LGBTQIA community. Um, also, it was incredibly fun. Uh, it's not every book that gives you a chance to think of uh, such level of richness and plurality and, and to be able to incorporate tons and different, of different details um, that are familiar and close to your heart. Um, I couldn't help myself and I ended up drawing <laughs> myself in there um, with a tear in my eye and a couple of extra white hairs um, because it truly moved me. And, and it was an incredible process to be able to illustrate this book. I hope it is a gift to younger generations to find themselves belonging and to realize that they can and will be represented in the stories we write and illustrate. So thanks again and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Juana. That was so terrific. And that was, wow, that was a fantastic look inside an illustrator's work. And I love just the looking at the intricate details that you have in there that adds so many layers to the characters and their relationship to each other and how it honors the history of Behind Pride and the beautiful message of the book. So thank you. And I, I think there's Juana and Lucas also placed in there somewhere. I think I saw them. <laughs> I found them. I yes. invite the audience to take a look. It's it's hard to find, but they're in there, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a, a bit of a find and, and seek, um, um, you know, elements throughout the book. I'll I'll just I'll just cheat and and show it here. But I couldn't have to, you know, add Juana and and her grandparents up here, and and it's. After all, it's me as a child, and 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 I it it was almost with a therapeutic effect of thinking that I could have shared this with my grandparents, who were absolutely extraordinary people, and and to think of that, um, you know, just as uh, as as Rajani was pointing out, that intergenerational complex fiber that we that we hold. Um, so yeah, there are tons of details like that throughout the book, and I hope many many of you will be able to find them and enjoy them. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for this gift. Um, it certainly is a gift. Um, so we will, I'm just popping in here to say we'll now move on to the reading of it. But before the, uh, we do the reading, we wanted to share a special video from the author Joanna McClintic uh, about the inspiration behind her writing. Hi everyone, I'm Joanna McClintock and I'm the author of Twas the Night Before Pride, illustrated by Juana Medina and published by Candlewick Press. And here's the cover. It's a story of a queer family getting ready to go to the Pride March and they talk about the history of the Stonewall Riots. And I wrote this book for many reasons, but I got the idea at one of my Pride gatherings. Me and my family do an annual Pride gathering and for years and years. And as we started to get older, our friends started to have children and the children would come to our gathering. And I just began to imagine how they were experiencing pride, like through their eyes and thinking, oh, maybe these young people will only think that pride is like rainbows and glitter and just a big party in the street, which it is. The whimsy's there, the fun is there, but how can I have a tool to explain the beautiful resistance that made Pride come to be. So I wrote this poem, I thought of Twas a Night for Pride, and I started to read it at our annual gatherings before Pride to my community. And there were some toddlers in the audience and they said to me, where are the pictures? So I said to myself, I will get them. And five years later, here it is. Um, Twas the Night Before Pride exists, which I can't believe, and imagining LGBT plus families snuggling down with this book or teachers and schools reading about it to learn more about Pride is just exactly what I wanted and my goal and hope for the book. So I hope you enjoy it and thank you very much. It's such a great message. I feel so lucky. <laughs> it just makes me giddy with excitement. All right, so here we go. It was the night before Pride. 
by, written by Joanna McClintock and illustrated by yours truly. It was the night before Pride, a warm evening in June, all the people got ready with the rise of the moon. The drag queens all brushed their wigs with great care and the bikers checked their tires to make sure they had air. All across the city, people's outfits were planned and instruments polished for the queer marching band. My mom told us all we should go to bed early. She's that kind of mom who's more boyish than girly. While mama finished packing our snacks in a bag, Sammy started chewing on the edge of our flag. That was lovely. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Oh, my pleasure. It's so good to be There's here. It's just, oh my gosh, we're so <laughs> lucky to have you here. There's just, you know, something about like hearing the text read out loud along with the illustrations that just, I don't know, it just makes the experience of the book even more powerful, especially with a book like this. It's just so wonderful to have that experience. So thank you. Um, all right, so we're gonna open up the floors for a few minutes of Q&A before we wrap up. I feel like I, I've seen a few questions come through and then, but also just like a general, like, yes, this is a great book. Like, thank you, Rita Auerbach out there. This is not a question she says, but just a tribute to Wana and her incredible research for this important book, which I agree. I'm, um, and then we also yeah, have looking, Randy. Uh, you know. sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah. my connection just no, kind no, of no. went down. Oh, hello? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. I'm I'm here. I, I just got I'm a glad. sign saying your connection is unstable, but I'm here. I'm here. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, just like a general of like celeb celebration of your work. And then I also have uh, Brandy Eichster saying, I love this so much. I can't wait to read the whole thing. Elizabeth Dejean, De um, Dijon, I'm sorry to if I mispronounced it. Um, she just says, thank you, Anna. And then I have a question from Cynthia Ritter. Hi, Cynthia. Um, is there a key included to who the people are, are on the end papers? <laughs> you know, that is an excellent question. Hi, Cynthia. I, I, I'm not exactly sure. I know there is a list um, and it was uh, talked about long and thoughtfully just to make sure that we had everyone that we could represent within the list. Um, I would be curious and um, and I'm sure we'll have an answer soon enough. Yeah, I think that there's gonna be um, a poster of this, uh, the last um, penultimate spread, I believe, or the, ulti mm -hmm. uh, the ultimate Ultim spread the one, also. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, which I love that one is such a great image and we'll be able to offer. I think there's like a fine, uh, like a activity also like, connected to that image as well and we can offer that later on um and then let me see if there's any other questions coming or what oh what is your favorite spread natalie says ha huh, that I that is it's a, a, <laughs> a hard <laughs> question there are details throughout that, that are particularly meaningful to me but obviously the last spread was a blast to work on just by the the amount of detail that's in it, which is something I hadn't done before, it was an, an incredible challenge to work in this book. This this might well be my my favorite illustration, um, just because it's so dynamic. And um, I mean, there are so many details. Mm -hmm. I I never thought, for example, that I would end up drawing someone, um, you know, dressed in leather, <laughs> in a children's <laughs> book. Uh, and and so it's it's it was just great fun to 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 be able to represent tons of people that I don't think traditionally make it into children's books. Um, and then this spread was uh, extremely challenging for me. Uh, perspective is not something that comes naturally. That sounds for deeper analysis, but <laughs> it, just, it, it, yeah. it was. Um, it, it, it was a big challenge and I wanted to make sure that I got it right. So the, the learning curve as an illustrator was steep here. Um, there were plenty of challenges in being more representational and working with a different color palette in many different ways. And so each spread I think uh, was th thoroughly thought about until we finally completed the book. <laughs> All right, sounds good. And then we have Karen Costco asking us, are you in the last spread? It's, it's yes. the, the image that you sent us, uh, you showed us. Is that in the yes, last slide? Yes, yes. That, that last image. Is that, there's a number of people I included within the book, and, and some of them you might recognize um, because they are part of, of the world of, of children's literature. 
Um, and, and yes, I shamefully um, included my family in, in the book because as I was saying, I, I don't think, I mean, personally, my, my children, they are four right now. And whenever they see a book where there's a nuclear family that is mother, father, and child or children, they are at, at a stage where they don't want to read that book. Um, and and it is it is significant and profound. And I think it, it, it speaks of our need for, for more books that show different families that might not be the most traditional type of family that we're used to seeing in children's books. And so I wanted to make sure that they could see themselves. There's a number of, of authors and illustrators within, within the last spread. Um, and uh, my art director, uh, and, and tons of people that I just wanted to make sure that were represented within. So, oh my yeah. gosh, I didn't know that. That's so cool. And I mean, Tommy DePaula, you said in your presentation too, which I was like, that's amazing that all these, it's like almost like an ode to the people who came before. So yeah, I love that little detail. Um, okay, so I think this is a good place to wrap up. Um, if you have any last words to share, please do wanna, um, but, but yeah, did, any last message for us? <laughs> oh, thank you. No, I'm just, I'm just, filled with gratitude to have the space to share this book with all of you and, 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 and to have been invited to illustrate it. What an exciting opportunity. So I can't wait to share it with all of you. Yeah, we yeah. can't wait either. It's such a <laughs> gift. Thank you so much, especially because, you know, we're living in a time when connecting with our community is just more difficult than ever. You know, I think this book is going to provide solace and warmth and rainbows to everybody, not just the young ones, but those readers out there who are all ages. So sending along another thunder, thunderous applause to our guest speaker, Juan oh, Dina. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, I can't believe it's over, but it looks like it's already time to wrap up our preview. Rajan, uh, Rajni, if you're still out there, um, uh, please join us for our collective goodbye. We'd love to see you. Thank you for sticking around. Um, so yeah. We hope that you enjoyed the preview as much as we did. Our next preview will be on Friday, September 24th at 2 p.m., same time as this one. And we'll be featuring our newest middle grade and YA books that you won't want to miss. So be sure to register for that event with the link that Dana will be dropping out, uh, in the chat box below. And we'll have a uh, best-selling and award-winning YA author, Nancy Whirlin, will tell us all about her debut middle grade novel, fantasy novel, Healer, Healer and Witch. And Christina Suntorvet, this year's two-time Newbery Honor winner for A Wish in the Dark in All 13, who will give us a sneak peek at her much anticipated new middle grade fantasy, The Last Map Maker. Make sure to pick up your virtual goodie bag on your way out, which will pop up in your browser. And if it doesn't, it'll um, come up in your inbox tomorrow with the link. It's a resource to all of the titles that were featured today and the presentation slides. So we'll all have that in one page for you there. And yeah, that's about it. Please continue to stay safe and be well wherever you are. Happy reading. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. <laughs>